Welcome to the D. Dorsey Moss Construction Lab at Purdue University. Uh, my name is Mark Zimfer. I'm an assistant professor of practice. Hi, I'm Scott Santon. I'm a continuing lecturer. Today we're going to start going through uh, the basics of framing. We're going to start at the foundation level and work our way up. So when we arrive on site, typically as a, as a framing contractor, the foundation is going to be complete. Hopefully we've done our, our leg work and we've already measured the foundation and check for accuracy, check for plumb level and square. That's how we like to build. Um, so we'd come and do our layout initially uh, so we're a little better prepared when we get to the site. So in our lab today, our elevated slab is going to represent our foundation. So this could be the top of the wall. It could be a... Um, slab construction um, and that's where we're going to anchor our sill plate which is short for mud sill. So here in the lab we've got anchor bolts uh, that have been drilled down into our slab. Out in the field those anchor bolts would be coming up through either the top of the wall or the slab themselves and based on your jurisdiction there's going to be a uh, code. The United States is underneath the IRC which is the International Residential Code and then each state gets to have an addendum to that code based on wind load, snow load, seismic, things like that. So you have to be aware of the code in your area to know what the anchor bolt layout's gonna be. And they'll have a layout for uh, a lineal footage spacing of the anchor bolts, how close you need to be to a corner, and how close you need to be a, uh, to each side of a splice in your sill plate. Mark, why do we have to bolt the sill plate in essence, the house down to the foundation? It's a great question, Scott. We can't count on the weight of the building to hold itself in place. So our foundation, uh, in essence, is anchored to the ground. We need to anchor the home or the structure to the foundation. And our anchor bolts and our sill plates act as that function. Plus, we're looking for a good transition from concrete and in this case to wood. By putting down the sill plate, we can then easily attach our floor system with a wood to wood connection rather than a wood to concrete connection. Mark, in our situation in the lab, we're, like you said, we're a little bit different than what we find out uh, when we're building uh, for somebody. Uh, we're missing uh, an important part of this transition between uh, the wood structure itself and the uh, either block or concrete foundation. Uh, could you tell the kids about Sill Seal? Absolutely. So the spot and the piece or product that Scott's mentioning here, we'd have a sealer in between our sill plate and our foundation. And this is a gasket, basically. What we're looking for is a good uh, break for air, moisture, uh, small bugs, things of that nature, because we're trying to build a good, tight, energy efficient building. That sill sealer can take many, many forms. It can be as simple as a piece of foam. As you can see here, it comes in different widths um, for a two by six sill plate or a two by eight or even a two by four. It also comes in different thicknesses and it comes in different materials. This is the basic foam material that's a sill sealer. They have rubber gaskets that can go in there. They have rubber gaskets that are in a T shape. So when the, the sill sealer goes down, the T will fold up and fold down so you get a good seal at the concrete to lumber connection. And again, that's to prevent uh, air movement, moisture movement, and small bugs from uh, coming into the home. So again, in our construction lab, our anchor bolts are sockets, uh, so we can remove the building to then uh, go to the next lab. Out in the field, this would be an example of an anchor bolt that would be embedded in the concrete or the concrete block. So it's a J-hook or an anchor bolt, goes down into the concrete, we leave the threads exposed, this helps uh, with uh, tension and pull strength coming out of the concrete, and we pour that in place. Uh, that would be, again, on a proper spacing based on code. Uh, so this would be down in this part of the concrete, and we'd put on a washer and a nut, again, according to code, and tighten our sill plates down. Keep in mind that the sill plate um, a lot of times it's just referred to as a sill. We know out in the field, the framers know this is going to be our first place uh, or first piece of lumber that'll go on the structure. 
don't confuse this with a window sill. Again, the, the term is uh, for mud sill, uh, which is the, the piece of lumber that goes on the bottom. Another thing to note here in the construction lab, we are using regular lumber. Out in the field, any piece of lumber that touches concrete, whether it's on the horizontal or the vertical, will be a pressure treated lumber uh, or a, a contact grade of lumber. There's multiple brands out there, but we would not do this in the field uh, because this lumber would rot uh, rather quickly in contact with the con concrete, which can have a tendency to hold moisture. So once our plates are down, we have to go to the next step or the next layer. And as long as we've made our adjustments, we can't guarantee that the concrete has been poured perfectly, right? There's only so much variance uh, uh, that the, or tolerance that the uh, concrete or foundation company can pour to. So we'll check all of our concrete. We'll then go ahead and square up our sill plate on the foundation. We can pull cross squares across the, the structure. We can pull a three, four, five and use the Pythagorean theorem to make sure that we're square. And we'll go ahead and make slight adjustments to the sill plate so we can start to straighten the building out from our first layer to our second layer. Then as we get to our third layer, our floor system, we repeat the same process. So each layer that goes up, we keep becoming more plumb level and square. So when we hit to the top of the building, uh, our pre-manufactured trusses are, are gonna land exactly where we want them to. Our next step after we've, we've squared up and attached our sill plates is to go ahead and do our first layout. So in framing layout, we'll have several basic tools that we'll need, carpenter's pencil uh, or Sharpie. Uh, you'll see a lot of times if we need to be working in wet conditions, waterproof, sometimes a constu construction crayon, um, speed square or a framing square, tape measure. Simple tools, uh, they can be very helpful on the job site, but we can easily screw up uh, simple tools if we're not careful. So when we're looking at our tape measures, we're really interested in a few uh, of our, our marks on here. They've been pre-laid out. Different colors, but typically we're gonna see our 16 inch on center in some kind of red or orange. So we see 16, 32, and it'll climb the tape 48 and, and so on and so, on, so forth. Um, Mark, what, what is a center? You use uh, 16 center. What does that mean? Great question, Scott. When we talk about on center, we're talking about the center of one framing member to the center of the next framing men, men, uh, member. So I can show that when we lay out our floor system. Typically, a floor system is going to be uh, anywhere from 12 inches on center. We can see the symbol there. 16 inches on center, 19.2, which is the little black diamond, or two foot on center. Those will be in most light wood construction. Those will be our on center measurements from center of one joist here to the center of the next joist as we move across the floor. Now for the framers, we don't want uh, everyone standing around on the job, right? Time is money. So we'll typically have one or two people that are running framing layout on the job while other people are uh, sorting the lumber, stacking lumber, pre-building some other components that we'll need later in wall construction. That way everybody is busy and being productive. So we can already tell if we're running uh, us on center measurement, we can look at the marks that have been laid out here on this sill plate. And we can see that the on center marks are at 16 and they've put an X to one side of the line. So we can tell, since we're not 16 inches from this end, they've run 16 inch on center from that end of the building and worked their way across. So as they came across, they marked their 16s, put their X to the side of the line where the uh, member would go, and that's our layout. So the layout person can be working their way across the building while the crew comes behind them and starts to put in the material. All right, Scott, so <laughs> we're on the job. We're having a good, good day so far. We've squared up our, our foundation. We've uh, cut and attached our sill plate, uh, tightened down all of our anchor bolts. We've done our 16 inch uh, on center layout, which we pulled from our blueprint or our floor system plan uh, that was you know, designed uh, by the company supplying the floor system. 
Uh, we've got that material on site. What's our next step? Well, we're going to start to prepare uh, our flooring system. So a couple things that typically we're going to look at is uh, we're going to size up our lumber. And what I mean by sizing up our lumber, we're going to check our lumber uh, to see if it's twisted. Is it cupped? Is it crowned? And all these different terms are just uh, telling you that the board's screwed up and we need to scrutinize that a little bit. Because the last thing we want to do when we have, uh, or with our flooring system, is to have depressions, dips. So if we, if we have a board that's got a little bit of a crown in it, to where it's bowed, okay, along the length of the board. We always want to crown up. So we want it to be bowed in the upward orientation with the bow up. If it's down, then we get depressions in the floor and that's never a good thing. So unfortunately, uh, today's lumber um, isn't old growth forest anymore. Uh, they're hybrid forests that are planted for quick turnaround to harvest the lumber for building construction, paper, and other things. Uh, and what's happened to our lumber supply is it's become very uh, erratic in how it comes to us. It's no longer true. You could always tell old growth wood because when you got the lumber, it was straight, it was true, it was flat, it was coming from the mill like it was uh, how it was machined and milled. Yeah, very uh, little bark edges, very right. little, uh, fewer knots. Right. Now, the good side to how, how lumber is grown, right, it's basically just a giant crop, uh, is that it's very sustainable. Right. right? The, the tree is doing good things for the environment while it's growing, uh, and we're not cutting down old growth forest, we're cutting down a crop that we just keep reproducing, reproducing. So Absolutely. there's good and no, bad. There, there is our good bad. It's bad for us as builders right. because our quality of work is attached to the quality of materials uh, and the quality of installation, uh, which we'll get into later. Uh, but back to the flooring system. So once we've sized up our lumber and we've checked for the crowning, we're going to mark those boards so that the people that are doing the installation know the orientation of the board. So Mark will demonstrate what we would do uh, out in the field to make this happen. And you can see all he did was put an arrow pointing the direction of the board. So somebody comes in and grabs that board, they always know that that crown needs to be up and the arrow is pointing to the crown and the direction that the board should sit in. So how we determine that as we get to our lumber and here's an example when we talk about bark in, in this new lumber or new or, new or lumber. We don't have a clean edge. It's still strong. We can still use it, but you can see the edging that's left on. So we take a piece of our dimensional lumber. Uh, in this case, it's a two by eight. Now let's keep in mind that it is not two inches by eight inches. It's an inch and a half by seven and a quarter. And we'll get into that detail a little bit later. But we'd take that piece of lumber, we'd hold it, and we would literally just sight down the board, and we'd look for that crown or some kind of, of uh, valley in that board. We'd also make sure it wasn't twisted, kind of like a, a Twizzler, uh, and we'd also make sure there wasn't big bows. If we know that it's good, we'd mark it and we'd stack it so it's ready to go, like Scott said, be dropped in. Now, Scott, do we have to do this for every type of floor system? In this case, we're using two by eights. This is a very small span, it's only eight foot, so we could be using two by tens, two by twelves, depending on the span from one bearing point to the other bearing point, but is there another type of floor system where we wouldn't have to go through this exercise? Absolutely there is, Mark. I'm glad you brought that up because uh Technology has brought us engineered lumber. Um, I think the first engineered lumber I ever was aware of were sheet goods. And if the camera will take a peek over here, we'll take a look at uh, oriented strand board. So this is an engineered uh, piece of plywood. And what we have is we have a lot of wood chips. And of course, always uh, business thinking about how to be more efficient, we had all of this waste all of the waste that was coming from the sawmill 
And somebody saw that by impregnating a bed of wood chips with some sort of epoxy resin glue, something that holds it together, and put it under compression, that we could create sheet goods that were, I don't want to say superior to uh, regular plywood, but certainly as good uh, strength-wise and much cheaper. Yeah, and much faster to install. Absolutely. Yeah. Prior to this, if we needed a sheet good on the, whether it was the floor system or the wall, we'd be using the individual strips of lumber. Here we have a four foot by eight foot sheet. They come in different sizes. Uh, and you can see it's listed out at seven sixteenths here. Uh, our manufacturer will stamp the pertinent information on the sheet, but this makes it really quick with two people and sometimes one person if you have the right blocking we can put in 32 square feet at a time by lifting that sheet in place as opposed to the individual pieces so i agree scott this was one of the first ones i was ever around oriented strand board there's lots of engineered sheet goods out there mdf all kinds of things so we can it, it bled over into dimensional lumber so now we can buy that same engineered wood pulp wood chip with some sort of uh, a resin that is the binding agent. Now we're starting to make two by fours, two by sixes, four by sixes. We have uh, uh, LVLs, laminate, I don't, I'm not sure what the acronym is. Yeah, laminated is. veneer lumber. Yeah. And uh, paralams, all these different type of engineered uh, structural members uh, that are true because they're made in a factory setting, quality is much higher, you know, in a manufacturing setting. Uh, you get, you're, it's a sustainable product. Uh, it's made with the scraps from the mill. Um, to me, it's a win-win, and they're incredibly strong. And we're not limited to the length, right? If we're right. talking about a 2 by 12 you need a certain size tree that we can get the 2 by 12 out of and you're limited by the length that the tree could grow to. When we talk about engineered products, specifically floor system, one of the most popular uh, right now is called an eye joist. Um, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It looks like a block eye. I'll draw one here. We have a top flange, bottom flange, and in between those flange is what's called the webbing. And this webbing right here would actually be a piece of our oriented strand board. And then the top and bottom flange can be engineered lumber. It could also just be made out of dimensional lumber, a two by two, a two by three, a two by four, again, depending on the span. The nice thing about eye joists, they're lightweight. We can put them in almost any length we want as long as we can ship them to the job site. So if we need a 48 foot long uh, floor system member, we've got it. That's impossible to find uh, and cost prohibitive to find if we were looking for a 2x12 that was lo that long. We'd have to splice multiple 2x12s together, which of course weakens the floor system. We also have another product called Open Web Floor Trusses uh, that, uh, that's uh, built similar to a roof truss with blocking of two by fours and two by sixes and we can show that product at a later time. So in this case we're sticking with dimensional lumber. We only have an eight foot wide structure so our span is small. Uh, we can stay with the small floor system. The height of the lumber, so the dimension of the lumber increases in height. Uh, this is a two by eight. Uh, we're, we're at about uh, you know an approximate eight foot span. So that's an appropriate structural member for the span that it's going to have to support. Uh, as that span gets wider apart, that dimensional lumber starts to grow in size. So maybe if we're at a 12 to 16 foot span, we may be using a 2 by 10 or a 2 by 12 instead of a 2 by 8. So the prints are always going to dictate to you what material. It's not something that uh, we're going to guess at. Right. We're going to use industry standards and the blueprints to choose what we need to use as far as materials are concerned. Yeah, we can refer to our span charts that tell us the grade of lumber, uh, the type of lumber, 
how far it could span based on what is going to sit on top of that floor system. Uh, we have to take into account live load, uh, which is the, the people and the objects on the floor, dead load, uh, which is the weight of the floor itself, and it has to self-support. Uh, so there's span charts that have been worked out for that. Plus our floor system companies, a lot of times we'll be buying a package of a floor system from a company. Uh, they will go through and engineer the floor based on the blueprint looking for uh, bearing walls, things of that nature. So when we get to the site, we can start uh, production as quick as possible and not be thinking, do I have the right floor system? That's all done in our pre-construction process. So just like we squared up and checked our foundation uh, for plumb level and square, we then made an adjustment to our floor system or our, our sill plate. Uh, then we would make an adjustment to the, to, the, uh, to the next layer up, which is our floor system. So we can see here a faint blue chalk line that is coming along because we don't want to count on the sill plate being perfectly straight. There may be a slight bow uh, that we missed in our sill plate or something like that. So we'd come in and we would pull a measurement back from the outside of the floor system uh, to the, where we think the end of our joist would be. And this is going to be predicated on what another part of our floor system, what the thickness is. And that's a piece of uh, material, again, engineered or dimensional, that's a rim board or a rim joist. Uh, you'll also hear an old term, a box sill. Box sill. Band board uh, is how I was taught the nomenclature. And that would be this member here. So the band board runs the perimeter of the foundation and it boxes in the tails or the ends of our joist. And you can see in the situation that we have here, we've pulled a section of the floor back so that you guys can get a clear view of what's happening here. So remember, we have our, our, our sill plate. We run the perimeter with our uh, 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 band board. Um, and then we're laying in our joist. So everything fits neatly within the outside of our sill plate. And you get a good picture of that right here. And once we've got everything put together, nailed in place or screwed, uh, whatever you're directed to do, then we come back and we start uh, our, our floor sheet. You have anything you want to add to that, Mark? Yeah, and in this case, since our uh, our band board uh, is dimensional lumber, we know it was an inch and a half, so we can pull back an inch and a half on this end, and you can see they had put a little carrot or a little mark on the board right there. We would have had one at the other end of our sill plate, and we would have used a chalk line, which is just a, a string in a, in a metal or plastic box full of exactly what you think, chalk, different colors. We'd shake it up, spread it out, we'd snap that line. That now gives us a straight line that we know is an inch and a half in from this corner and from the other corner of that sill plate that we're running. And it's, it's important to go back to what you said earlier, that we build plumb level and square. And when we're squaring up our foundation, it happens with the sill plate, but we also are going to check it again as we're laying out for our band to make sure that what we're doing is square because if we're not square we can slide the structure off of the sill plate and if you try to correct it by just following what the foundation does sometimes we end up in very bad predicaments um, i had a, an instance where we were building a home that was uh, pre uh, prefabricated <laughs> And so everything was coming out in panels, the flooring system, as well as walls, roofing, whatever. Everything was, was panelized. And the people that had laid in the foundation were three inches out of square on that foundation, three inches. Uh, so what we should have done, uh, the guys that were doing the layout for the flooring system, we should have shifted it an inch and a half or half of the error we bring that in and that would have squared up the foundation. A very, very, very simple but crucial step because the result was we were three inches out of square on one end of the building. And when we started to lay the panels across, we started to realize as the 
Because the panels have to go together the way they go together because they're what? They're built square. Right. So as we were laying the floor across, we could see the floor system start to leave the edge of the house or come off of the band, or not the band, the silk plate. Remember, we're building a high-tech product. When we're, even when we're talking a simple house, it's still a high-tech product. We have water, air, electricity, gas. It is a high-tech product being built in an uncontrolled environment. So we say, how did we have that air in the foundation? Errors are going to happen. But it's our job as a construction manager to keep an eye on the process and try to adjust for error in every single level. So we got our first chance here. We got our, when we adjusted our sill plates, we got our second chance when we squared in this line, then we can put in our floor system. And as we work through each layer, we'll take another opportunity to square and plumb and level the building. Always remember, as managers, we are responsible for quality control on our projects, which means that by being aware, you don't necessarily have to understand how to do something, but you need to be able to observe somebody doing the very thing that you need them to do so that we maintain the quality of the product. It's a great point, Scott. I mean, we, we've talked about before. Am I gonna be a framer after coming through construction management school? Am I gonna go out and be putting shingles on a building? You know, those are things that we do in our lab. We build a two-story steel structure. I think part of it is to make sure our students have an appreciation for the trades, yeah. that you've done it, you've felt what that concrete block feels like in your hands, you've felt the piece of steel, you've run a, a, a string line or a chalk line. Uh, and it's hard to manage people when you don't understand what their job is like. So we're not teaching skilled trades here, we're teaching the process, the terminology, the techniques to make you a little bit more aware in the field and hopefully ask questions. Uh, I think that's one of the best things you can do when you're, when you're around your skilled trades is, is if you see a different technique than what maybe what you were taught or learned, ask. Ask, hey, can you show me that again? Why did you use that technique at this particular time and continually learn uh, the best techniques that are out there? It'll make you a better manager in the long run. Absolutely, Mark. So the purpose or purposes of the band joist, box sill, rim joist, rim board, all these different names uh, that this product could be called depending on uh, when you came uh, up through the ranks, is multifold. We are trying to box off the end of our floor system, as Scott said earlier. Um, we can't have, again, air, uh, moisture, snow, bugs coming into our floor system. So that's the most basic function that it's going to have, is to block off the end of the floor system or cap it off. The other function is, and this is another part of our QAQC, is we want to reinforce the strength of our floor system. So we think uh, at our most, uh, the strongest point the floor system is going to be is when it is perfectly square and perpendicular to our rim joist. As soon as that floor system starts to turn a little bit and get off of a 90 degree to our um, sill plate, it loses strength. So we want the rim board there and we'd attach through our rim board this way into our floor system to help hold that floor system in place. It's somewhat temporary because we'd be putting our floor decking on next, but we know that the structure is at its strongest before we move to the next level, which is critical. Scott, could you hand me the speed square there for a Absolutely, minute? Absolutely, Mark. So this is another place where a framing square or a speed square uh, makes perfect sense. We can lay in our joist, we can set our speed square down on the sill plate and slide it over and read the gap behind the uh, speed square or framing square and make sure that our floor system is tipped exactly where we want it. We don't want it leaning to the right, we don't want it leaning to the left, we want it perfectly square to that sill plate. Once we have it in place, we can then go ahead and shoot in our fasteners or hand drive in our fasteners, and we know that that floor system is ready to receive the floor decking. Now we're going up to our next layer. It'd be time to put on our floor decking. Um, and that's what it sounds like. We need something that we can stand on. 
We need something that we can build our walls on. So you can see we're already several components up into the structure, starting at ground level and working through our foundation. So is this called a subfloor? Absolutely. So depending on terminology, depending on are we talking to the architect, the engineer, the skilled trade, uh, a fellow contractor or builder, or the owner. And sometimes we add the other parties, the inspector, the bank uh, examiner, all the different parties that take place in a construction site. The terminology is going to be a little bit different. And you as the manager, construction manager, have to know kind of what terminology to use. Most of the owners and designers, things like that, this is just a floor. For us, it's the subfloor because we know it's not the finished floor. So it is sub to whatever our floor covering is going to be. In this case, we're back to another engineered product. And uh, to expound on that a little bit, uh, with it being a sub floor and not the finish, we could leave it like this for a couple of products. We could put a wood floor on that. We could put carpet. We could put, uh, uh, that's about it. Well, we can do a vinyl. But what, what floating. We, but my point with the being a subfloor is if we're going to move into vinyl or stone, uh, uh, that type of flooring, we're going to put down uh, a laminate on top. So usually we're going to put down uh, 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 a mahogany, uh, what are they called? Like a luon sheet. Uh, a luon, yes. Qu yeah. Quarter inch. Something really smooth. Very smooth. Very clean. This has got texture to it. And what's going to happen during construction, it's going to pick up some moisture, which increases the level of texture. You can see the painted edges. This is done by the manufacturer to help seal off the ingrain of the floor system. And they have lots of different grades. It's like anything. You can spend as little as you, as you want for a, a floor decking or a subfloor. They also have subfloors that are out there, uh, if you're willing to pay, that are completely uh, sealed starting from the inside to the out, and they will give you a 180 day or more sand warranty, which means you put the floor down, it can be fully exposed to the weather for 180 days, and you don't have to come back in and sand the seams between the two sheets. That's where they'll have a tendency to swell up with moisture. So it depends on what product you buy, what product's been specced, and what the budget is for the product. Because a regular piece of OSB like this, how many times would you say it's good? A couple, three times of rain, maybe yeah. a few more before it starts to swell. It, it starts to absorb water like a sponge, and it starts to expand. And that's what Mark means when he's saying coming back and sanding our joints, because this is where it's going to want to pucker. You're on your seams, we're going to want to pucker up as it's wicking moisture into the sheet. And we would typically come in with a drum sander and we would sand all of those seams down so that you couldn't, as walking across carpet, not feel them. Right. Yeah. And so that's where you have to understand the duration of your project. Right. If you're going to build a small wood structure and it's going to have a f wood floor system and put your walls on top of it, if you're going to get it closed in, meaning I'm not talking about finish, but you've got your walls built, your wall sheathing on, the roof structure on top of it, and at least some kind of felt or roofing paper on, you're starting to pretty well protect that floor system. If you can do that in a matter of days, you probably don't need one of the higher end or higher engineered sheets. But if you're on a very large project that you're working across the job and it's gonna take six, eight weeks or more before this product is protected, that's where you'd want to spec out yeah. uh, or specify a better product. Yeah, and those materials you see that are the higher dollar that give us a greater level of protection against the elements, you're going to see those materials quite a bit more in commercial construction. Of course, our buildings in commercial construction get much larger uh, than a typical house structure, uh, so it's open for longer periods of time and susceptible to rain, wind damage, uh, a myriad of things. Uh, so you'll see, you'll see products that are designed specifically to take that uh, because of the duration of exposure. I couldn't help but notice, Scott, this sheet looks a little different on the edges than the sheet of 
7 16 wall sheathing. So is wall sheathing different than subfloor? Absolutely it is. Uh, wall sheathing, we're not putting a load on it, a live load again, you know, unless you lean something up against it. But our flooring, um, as we come up, you know, you stand in between uh, the joist, you've got a little bit of deflection. Um, so when we have a, a seam, that would be really bad at that point. So what they designed is a tongue and groove system. One, in, one, one side of a plywood has a tongue on it, and the other has uh, a groove. And we lay the plywood in place, and we beat it across, and we beat that tongue into the groove. And what that does is, is it allows us a greater amount of bearing capacity in between the joist on the seams, uh, which is really imperative. And that helps lock those two pieces together. Absolutely. This is another important part of our structure. So the tongue and groove that Scott was talking about, here's the tongue. It's the piece on the subfloor that projects out. You can see it's carved in into the piece from the manufacturer and then it's also sealed. We know at this seam that we're going to get moisture that rolls down in there so they put on that painting as a protectant. And then on this side, our opposing side, is the groove. So when we see that specified in a blueprint, we might see something that says subfloor uh, equal to three quarter inch, that's our thickness, T and G. The T and the G stand for tongue and groove. And that's in uh, opposed to, say, just a three-quarter inch OSB, which would have square edges all the way around. So when those two sheets come together, the tongue fits into our groove, and we would drive the sheet to a tolerance here that the manufacturer specifies. Once it's in place, then we can go about with our fastening down into our floor system. Mark, what kind of fasteners are we typically using today? Is there a process that... Is there some sort of material that we put between the joist and the OSB? Yeah, anytime we put two pieces of material together and mechanically fasten them, we have a chance for failure. And by mechanically fasten, I mean nails, screws, and there's all different sizes, lengths, diameters, even types of nails. Uh, Glue-coated gun, uh, gun nails that we'd use a a uh, nail gun, whether it's an air or gas powered, and then our old school hand drive, which is a hammer and driving each nail individually. Do you ever live in an old home? Oh, absolutely. So what was the big thing with old homes? I can tell you my experience. Floor squeaks. Floor squeaks. Made it hard to sneak out, right? When you're growing up and you're, not that I ever did it, but he <laughs> did. Uh, it made it hard to sneak out of the house. You're tiptoeing through the house and it's an old house and you'd hit the one board uh, or subfloor where we had that belly that, or that valley that we were talking about in the, in the uh, floor joist and that floor decking subfloor would compress into that valley and squeak on the nail. You usually either got really, really good at avoiding the squeaks as you went through, or you didn't go out much. That's right, I had my house all mapped out, that's for sure. <laughs> so now what we do, uh, we try to help eliminate that. We know, again, even if we did a great job siding our floor system, maybe we've gone with an engineered floor system and it's, you know, they tell us it's perfectly straight, it's not. We're still putting two pieces of wood together in this case. Right, and what happens when you load something? Right, we're gonna get some deflection. Get deflection. So there's the several product. products we can use. There's subfloor adhesive, uh, and now uh, that, that just picture glue, construction adhesive, comes in regular um, caulking gun tubes, comes in great big quart tubes, which are as big as your forearm, uh, comes in 55 gallon drums with the hose that you can apply between the floor system, the top core of the floor, and our subfloor. And it's just a glue or adhesive to help fill the void. Now, uh, as time has gone on, we've gone more to like a foam glue. Uh, we can have a, 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 a metal wand or gun in our hand, a quart size tube that hooks to that, and it actually squirts out a foam uh, that is an adhesive. Uh, some really neat products out there because we can use that even if the lumber's a little wet from a uh, rain that may be have moved through the night before. Uh, we can go ahead and put that adhesive on, slide our floor into place, and then get ready to fasten it.
Is that foam like Gorilla Glue that it's expanding and it gets deeper into the pores of the wood and creates a superior bond? It right? does. When that glue locks in, uh, it's there to stay. Um, it, it usually has to wear off your fingers, yeah. so we, re manufacturers recommend gloves. Of course, eye protection. Safety is always a concern on a job site. It's an inherently a dangerous place. It is a very dangerous material, guys. Any, any of that foaming adhesive or spray foam that we use for insulation purposes. Um, I have a good friend who uh, was, we were foaming in uh, a shower that I have. Uh, the, the, the foam that keeps the shower floor in place and not deflecting had worn thin. Uh, so we were put, putting some foam to keep the bottom up. That foam leaked and hit him right above his safety glasses. And believe it or not, by the time we got it off, it's left a mark that he still has today. It burnt him. Sure. Yeah, so, it's, a, it's a chemical based right. foam, so, right? So, you know, we're, we're very, very uh, blase about safety with regards to known materials that you can go to Menards or any box store, any lumber yard, anywhere in the country and buy these products. And in construction, we have to be mindful of the products we're using because we use caustics, you know, a, a myriad of things that are bad for us as humans. Not, but not only bad for your skin, but off-gassing as well. Absolutely. Since there are a lot of solvent and chemical based, we're applying those. Fortunately, we're usually working outside, but as the shell of the building starts to close in and we're still using those products, we can get uh, a lot of that off-gassing, which can cause us problems. It yeah. can also cause the occupant of the building problems. So it's good to always read the instructions, understand the conditions under which you're supposed to use the product and where you should not be using that product. Right. Take the warning seriously. And if nothing else, it's a liability issue, right? And I don't mean liability uh, of, of injury. We, we know about that. I'm talking about liability of the structure itself. You don't want to have to redo a structural component because remember these are the first few layers that we're putting on picture this as a finished structure and now we have a failure here the only way to get back to this spot is to tear down part of the building to get back to our first you know you know the the second third fourth layer in the system that we're building we don't like reworking construction it's not good for the owner it's not good for the schedule and it's definitely not good for your pocketbook uh, of you or your company as the construction manager. That's right. Scott, there's kind of a rule of thumb of uh, 1, 10, 100, 100, I believe. Yeah, so when we look in terms of, of new construction, it's a one-to-one -one cost. Hopefully, I would like to have like a 80 cent to the dollar cost to build a structure, right? Because that 20% would be profit. But uh, the worst case scenario is the money we bid is what we spent to put it in place. Now here's what happens if we don't put it in right the first time is we start to multiply that cost. So we look at it as we're at the end of the job and something that we did pops up on a punch list. And a punch list is a list that is collated by uh, usually a construction manager, architect, one of those stakeholders on the project are going to hand the contractor a list of all the mistakes, uh, you know, nick doors, blemish, blemishes everywhere with paint, whatnot. Uh, so if I have to come back on the punch list to fix this floor here because something wasn't installed properly and it's sticking out like a sore thumb, sometimes our mistakes are buried. And, and we don't see those at a later date uh, until the third possibility, and we'll get to that. But coming back on the punch list, I'm going to spend 10 times the money if I have to fix that. 10 times the money. So if that cost me a dollar, now it's 10 bucks to fix it. That's during punch list, assuming I'm still on the job. Okay? The third or the hundred times the cost is when I have to come back. I've already completed the job, but I have to warranty my work in commercial construction. That's usually a year, unless the owner buys a longer warranty. 
uh, which is very expensive. Um, and Mark's World Residential, you're bound for what, 10 years? We're 10 typically? years on major structural, right, major structure. seven on the roof, four on mechanicals, uh, and two kind of bumper to bumper, right, all inclusive. So if Mark has to come back in a year to fix that floor, that's going to cost him 100 times. He has to remobilize. He's got to, if he doesn't self-perform the work, He's got to pay a contractor to come in, and let's just say that we have the problem is in this area. If I've got a two-story structure and it's a, a masonry front, or we get into all of this scenario, th these different scenarios, it could cost him a, a hundred dollars, not one dollar it took him to build. So the moral of the story is, do it right the first time. That's 100% right. So when you then take that compounding effect on when was the defect found and when do you fix it, and then now you have to add on top of all that, if I had to pull you off of that end of the building to come back and fix this, we've already paid to have this installed. Now I'm calling Scott back over. He's going to have to uninstall it. So I've, that's now the second time I've paid. Then he's got to reinstall it the correct way. That's the third time I've paid. And this whole time, he should have been at the other end of the building installing right. something else. So we're now at a factor of four on the 1, 10, 100. Right. So if that doesn't scare you, nothing will. We want you to pay attention every step of the way to QAQC, quality assurance, quality control. So Mark, if it... Let me give you a scenario, because let's talk about the money aspect and what we have to make to make up that money. Yeah. Will we so talk let, about margin? Let's just margin? say $1,000 FUBA on warranty. How much money does your company have to make to pay that $1,000? Yeah, because what happened is a $1,000 mistake is $1,000 of cash out of the company. So that's $1,000 worth of profit. So depending on what sector of the industry we're working in, whether it's commercial, um, heavy civil, residential construction, your profit margins are different. In commercial, it can be anywhere from a zero profit margin where you're just keeping your company busy, busy up to a typically two, three percent. Right. National average is about three. In residential, our margins are higher, but our liability is greater. So we may be up at 10%, 15%, 18%. Renovation work, again, more liability, the profit margins go higher. So let's just pick a nice number. It's a 10% profit margin. I just paid out $1,000 to fix a problem. That's $1,000 of my profit gone. In order to get that $1,000 back in my hand, I would need to bill at least $10,000 additional. Actually, I'd have to take my tax liability right. into account because we're not allowed to make money and not pay taxes on it. So, so you, may, you might be at $12,000 of billable cost in order to get the $1,000 back in your hand from the mistake that you just fixed, plus all the lost time that we already discussed. Yeah. So that's why we're critical on doing each step correctly. That's, that's one thing that a lot of contractors don't understand when they do shoddy work initially, is that it just hurts your company exponentially in the long run. Yeah. Because when we accept shoddy work to begin with, you're not gonna be in business very long with those numbers. Especially when you know the owner of the companies, that's his living. Right. And, you know, reputation, everything just starts to erode. So we know there's going to be mistakes, but that's why we try to catch them and clean them up as we go. Similarly, as we talked about each level, as we came up making adjustments, we're getting ready to see another one. So we've laid in our floor decking or our subfloor. We've gone through, we've used our adhesives. Obviously in the lab, we don't have an adhesive down because after we build these wood structures, we tear them back down so we can clean the lab back up so we don't see our adhesive. Uh, but we'd wanna see some squeeze out on the edges. That's a good uh, QAQC is you walk underneath the floor system and look up and we'd like to see some glue squeezed out uh, periodically to know that it's there if we weren't on site when they were applying it. We then do the nailing pattern or screw pattern that the manufacturer recommends for their product. If it's, you know, um, 
six inches on center, six inches OC along the perimeter of that sheet. Uh, and then out in the field, which means out in the middle of the sheet, it might go to eight or 12 inches on center for those fasteners. But whatever it is, we follow the manufacturer's specs. We get everything ready to go. Uh, now we're ready to move up to our next layer. But what, before we do that, Mark, uh, we have a situation here. Uh, if we pull this sheet away, we see that these sheets aren't running. They're running parallel through here, right? We've got two rows of uh, uh, floor sheeting coming through, but we've got an offset here. And to me, it looks like about four foot. What are we, what are we, why is that? Why can't we just run the sheets two at a time down through here and be done with it? Yeah, that's a great question. We're trying to do something that's called stagger the joint, right? When we stagger the joint, we take a weak spot and we separate it from the next weak spot. So we want to break our sheets, meaning we want to split our sheets on are on center. So you can see this had been an eight foot sheet coming down and it breaks or stops right in the middle of my floor system. Then I can take off with the next sheet. So I've provided bearing point underneath the two edges of the sheet. We don't want that break to line up side by side because we've created a weak spot in the floor that could kind of hinge back there because the seam ran all the way through. So if I stagger my joints, and these happen to be four by eight sheets, so that means we're gonna stagger by 50%. So we'll run this next sheet, we'll come across eight foot, and that puts the joint or the stagger at four foot, right. which makes the whole system stronger. We do that in everything. We do that when we do uh, concrete block. We do it with brick. We do it with the floor system. If you can go ahead and take a look, here's an example in our concrete block or CMU, concrete masonry unit, where we've staggered the joint or staggered the seam. And that makes the system stronger. There's all types of staggers we can use. Again, we go back to our specifications. And is there a stagger based on the strength of the material? Or is there a stagger based on how we want the material to look? Always follow the specifications and get the stagger correct. On our floor system, this was a very easy stagger uh, to lay out. And you'll even see beyond the painted edges, the manufacturer has actually provided some of our layout marks for us. So when we're talking about 16 inches on center or two foot on center, we can see that the manufacturer has already dropped in paint lines for us as a reference. This means the crew that's installing can follow the paint line with their nailing pattern or screwing pattern and know that they're getting into the joist. Here it's very easy to see, oh, my joist is right there. But if this next sheet was dropped in and I've got my back turned, if we've done our on center spacing right, I know I can come right down with a nail gun or a hand drive and follow this paint joint all the way through and know that I'm gonna get into my structural member. In this case, this was the 16 inch on center. They also have marked out the two foot on center, which are the two most common uh, on centers that we'll see with the floor system. That's why it's critical that when we do a layout, we follow the layout all the way through because the crews coming behind us are looking for that same layout. When we build a wall 16 inches on center uh, for our stud placement, we know that the drywaller that's coming in to do the finish on the inside of the building is also looking for 16 inch on center. They need to know where that stud is. We know that the finished carpenter that comes in after the drywall company and that's gonna hang a cabinet or another product on the wall is also looking for 16 inch on center. So it's all predicated on everyone following the same system. Where did 16 inch on center come from? It's a great question. Uh, we think a lot of these techniques actually came out of uh, Levittown, uh, which we're gonna learn about this semester. Levittown was the first yeah. subdivision, or I guess, um, what would you call it, suburb, uh, in the United States right. right after World War II. They were hot and panelizing, standardizing manufacturing practices to speed up the construction process. Uh, my grandfather, being a carpenter uh, back when Moby Dick was a chub, somewhere in the late 1800s, uh, they framed a, diff a, a different way. Uh, 
because they used lath and plaster on the inside of the house. Right. So you didn't have to have a standardized layout for any of your structural members because plaster was a, a loose mix that was troweled on. So as long as you had enough bearing to stand the structure up, you didn't have to have the standardization for sheet goods. Sure. So they would use the distance from a man's elbow to the palm of his hand. And Mark and I, me being uh, shorter than him, I'm going to say his, his, his distance from his elbow to the palm is a different distance than mine. So, but that didn't matter. And they put members in like that. That's when they were stacking balloon framing homes, they'd shove the member in, nail it, and the guy that was up on the second story would slide it in, nail it, and that's how they built no standard materials. No standard. So the whole purpose of going to standardized materials was speed and Absolutely. cost. We weren't cutting down a tree out on our property to build our home. We were now going to a lumber yard and having that product supplied by a manufacturer. You can't manufacture at low cost and rapidly without standardization. Right. Kind of like what we saw Henry Ford do with the automobile. Yep. Standardize the parts, standardize the construction, kind of an assembly line approach, construction, took the same approach. And that's why we see a lot of things based on that 16 inch on center measurement. So our wall studs, 16 inches on center, we look at uh, four by eight sheets is very common for our wall sheathing, our subfloor, our drywall goods and other sheet goods are in that four by eight um, increment because it works well with our 16 inch on center. I heard you say wall framing. Shall we move on to the wall frame? Yeah, one more thing to point out on the floor system. We talked about adjusting each layer. Mm -hmm. So now we've come up, we've made these micro, hopefully micro, we haven't had to make any macro adjustments. We're making small adjustments as we go up through the floor system. Now it's time to get out our chalk line again. We're gonna look at our blueprint. We're gonna see what the wall layout is, where we're pulling the outside of framing that could be based on the thickness of our wall sheathing. Um, we're gonna come in based on the blueprint and based on trying to square up. This is another opportunity for us to square up the house because we're getting ready to put down another plate, uh, just like we did down here. This is a bottom plate now, it's not a sill plate uh, because we're not down at the mud sill level. We would come in uh, based on the print and we would make another pencil mark and we would strike another line with our chalk line. That sets the wall line that we're gonna build to and that lets us tweak that wall a little bit. If we need to, to make a quarter of an inch adjustment in a 20 foot wall just to try to get it perfectly plumb level and square, we can do that during this step. Mm -hmm. So typically we'd see that that uh, layout person working their way across the whole subfloor, snapping lines with the partner based on the blueprint. Mark, is it a smart thing to do with your crews to have the same people doing the layout day to day? I've always liked uh, dedicated layout people because <clears throat> let's say you and I are, are the layout personnel for a project. We know how to communicate. We may have come up with some hand signals on a loud job site where we're, we may be snapping a line that's 100 foot long or more where we would need a helper in the middle and we can't hear each other. We know that we're always reading the certain side of the tape measure, meaning when we take the thickness of our chalk line into account, are we putting it dead center on our measurement? Are we gonna roll the line to the right or to the left? We start to come up with a pattern or a rhythm uh, and we can really do our layout efficiently. Because you gotta remember, we may have one or two or sometimes three people maybe doing layout on our chalk lines to build our walls and we may have 10, 15 or more carpenters behind them building walls and getting ready to slide them into place. So we have to be quick and efficient on our layout, but we, above all, we have to be accurate. Right, and accuracy, always on my jobs, it was one person responsible for that. Usually the smartest guy on the crew gets that job. They gotta be able to, this is where, um, interpreting, right? You have to have that skill set to be able to go through the blueprint, 
recognize the information you need and recognize where you're missing information because there's never been, in my opinion, a perfect blueprint, okay. right? We always have some details or a string line, a measurement line that was left off. And if you read the fine print of the blueprint, it says, don't scale the blueprint call for clarification. So we may be missing a measurement that we need to get some data from. So your layout person has to be able to look at that blueprint, interpret the blueprint, and transfer that from a blueprint to a chalk line, which then translates to an actual structure. Right. It's a skill set that has to be practiced with repetition. It, it has to go the way the blueprints show because the architects code checking as they're designing. So a door needs to be in a certain place. A sink needs to be in an outlet around a sink has to be in a certain place. All of this stuff, all this layout has to be interpreted properly and then it has to translate to the structure. And if we have multiple people doing that, you're gonna have multiple interpretations. And that is never good. And that's the skill set too, not just for our layout crew or the framer. The project manager, construction manager also has to be able to interpret that blueprint. You arrive on site or you come from another part of the site to where they're framing up a structure, you need to have your set of documents and be able to do your QA, QC walkthrough, uh, tape measure in hand, um, blueprint, and be able to say, yes, that wall was built correctly, it is in the right spot, and do those spot checks as we go through. So you can't just rely on all your skilled trades. They may be an expert in framing, but we gotta remember they're working in an uncontrolled environment. Later this week, it's gonna be 97 degrees. I guarantee you we'll get to the three or four of the afternoon, hottest part of the day, somebody will start to get a little dehydrated, They've got sweat running in their eyes. They misinterpret a three for an eight or vice versa on the blueprint, and there's gonna be a mistake made in layout. Not intentional, it's just part of the job. And somebody's gotta be checking uh, on the backside of that and looking for those to try to keep the project as clean as possible. Yeah. And you've gotta be there in real time doing your job, checking this stuff, because once construction begins, we waste no time. And if you're not there catching out, doing your job, then, or have built relationships with your subcontractors that you have a level of trust. That doesn't mean that mistakes don't happen. It just means that you've worked with somebody on a consistent basis and you understand the way they do things. So you can trust that. But if it happens, work can get up. A lot of work can get built in a day and all of a sudden, that dollar for dollar, all of a sudden turns into the 10 for one. 